I dreamt last night the moon was so bright it melted the walls away and it wasn't alarming when I saw a prince charming come into my bedroom and say let me persuade you to come to the place where tomorrow meets today Ooh. If you were a scientist, you were in. Your excellent science, I'm your faithful servant. Building a new world. When did all this begin, Dad? Well, son, it's a very old story. It's, uh, it's so old, it's hard to say when it really began. Could have been back in 1540 when Copernicus identified the Earth as a speck of dust moving in an orbit around the sun. Or it could have been in 1905 when a young German physicist arrived at a fundamental truth that matter could be converted into energy and express it in the equation E equals MC squared. Then there were other dates. 1937, the first industrial atom smasher. 1942, the first nuclear chain reaction. 1945, the bomb. Somewhere in the course of these events, the dawn came up on the atomic era. It's going to have a tremendous effect on our town down there, son. It'll be felt in every town in America. And it won't matter if they make ships or shoes or ceiling wax. With atomic power, it will come benefits to mankind that we can as yet only imagine. I've got a call with Governor. Yes, sir, I do. Uh, I think you've got to talk to him immediately. To uh, do it immediately, we're operating almost totally in the blind. His information is ambiguous. Mine is non-existent. I don't know, uh, you know a couple of uh, blind men uh, now have to stagger around making decisions here. In 1945, in the aftermath of war, scientists were heroes, particularly the physicists who had built the atomic bomb. They are men, said Life magazine, who wear the tunic of Superman and stand in the spotlight of a thousand suns. In the public imagination, atomic scientists had harnessed a terrifying power which could literally reshape the world. We knew the world would not be the same. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. Many of the scientists who had worked on the atomic bomb felt a deep sense of guilt about what they had done. They were convinced they now had a moral duty to use the immense forces they had unleashed to better peaceful purposes. What they did not foresee were the demands that would be made on them when their science came out of the laboratory and into the world of politics and big business. They would lose control and be forced to compromise and to deceive. So all of a sudden we found that as scientists and technologists we were capable of changing in a massive way the framework in which society functioned. I and many others felt that nuclear power represented a major energy future for the world. You have to understand that this was the first time that mankind had ever found an energy source which wasn't a routine natural phenomenon. Fire, of course, comes every time a lightning strikes a forest. Nuclear power was something else completely. We made it. And our ability to give the world 
a what appeared to be and still does appear to be a limitless energy source for the future uh, was to uh, any scientist and engineer probably the most exciting philosophic concept you could find. Today at Shippingsport, Pennsylvania, we began building our first atomic power plant of commercial size. Mankind comes closer to fulfillment of the ancient dream of a new and a better Earth. The scientists have provided us with an example of nuclear science at work. In this baton, there is a small source of neutrons. I bring this source of neutrons over to this place in which we have uranium, and we set up a bit of atomic fission. This will move the marker on the scale and finally light the light, and the project will be started. of the United States has just started off electronically the groundbreaking power shovel 1,400 miles away in Shippingport, Pennsylvania. In this general mood of enthusiasm for science, politicians began to look to atomic power as more than just cheap electricity. It became the way to a better world. Это были годы, годы больших надежд. Только что умер Сталин, пришел к власти Хрущев. И атомная энергия рассматривалась как средство для достижения лучшего уровня благосостояния народа. Тем более, что мы все тогда были загипнотизированы ленинским лозунгом. У Ленина есть такой лозунг. Коммунизм – это значит советская власть плюс электрификация всей страны. Вот электрификация – это атомная энергия, плюс советская власть, и значит – коммунизм. At the very same time as Eisenhower began construction at shipping port, Russia suddenly announced it had already built the world's first nuclear power station. What the Soviets did not reveal was that it took more electricity to run the plant than it produced. Then in 1956, another country entered the nuclear race. In this case, the atom's role was to recapture the glories of the past. Tomorrow, Her Majesty the Queen, here at Calder Hall in Cumberland, is to open the first nuclear power station in the world to operate on an industrial scale. Our prosperity in the Victorian era, wrote the government's scientific advisor, Lord Charwell, was due to the men who put Britain 80 years ahead in the use of steam power. Our prosperity in the coming century will depend on learning how to exploit the latent energy in uranium. Uranium. Well, now that is uranium. That little black thing I'm holding in my hand, two pounds of that size of uranium. And the potential energy which could be given off by this when properly used is equal to the energy, or the heat, if you like the word better, produced by 2,600 tons of coal. That is uranium. Atomic scientists, by a series of brilliant discoveries, have brought us to the threshold of a new age. It is with pride that I now open Calder Hall, Britain's first atomic power station. The British government announced that by 1965, half the country's electricity would come from nuclear power. Now, now Dr. Leslie, we, see, it seems to me, in, in the building of this great place and its operation, have actually got ahead of the Russians and of the Americans. Yes, the atom is on its way to brighten our towns and to help manufacture our most dependable and indispensable household servants. In the late 50s, the Atomic Energy Commission made films that portrayed an atomic future in America. Scientists designed nuclear cars, planes and rockets. Others predicted whole new cities powered by vast atomic engines. If somehow a product could be atomic, it had to be good. ...which are now being developed with atomic energy. Even your toothpaste may be a product of the atomic age. Да, я считаю, что, в общем, это был, это был золотой век физики. И вообще появление энтузиазма у ученых, у специалистов. Они многое могут, многое могут. 
Вот, что у них какие-то большие возможности появляются. Science for the world. A dynamic world moving rapidly, flying, reacting to flashes on the radar screen, watching schedules where everything is calculated down to seconds and fractions of seconds. Science has permeated our very existence and can no longer detach itself. The station is to be situated on the shores of a forest lake. During the rest period, a magic silence reigns around the building site. But now, just when the scientists were being swept along on a wave of publicity, they began to discover it was going to be far more difficult to produce nuclear power than they had first thought. The problem was the cost of building the reactors. They were proving too expensive to compete with conventional fuels. In the Soviet Union, this led to increasing pressure to build fast, often without proper protection from nuclear radiation. In February 1957, the planner in charge of the whole nuclear power program died from an accidental burst of radioactivity. Давили на нас, конечно, экономические факторы, желание сделать подешевле, подоступнее эту энергетику, эту энергию. Ну, естественно, хотя мы понимали, что надо делать станцию безопасной и так далее, но все-таки экономика она очень сильно владела нашим сознанием. Они настолько быстро двигались, что кое-что не успели просто еще сделать. И поэтому, может быть, мы недостаточно уделяли внимание рассмотрению вопросов обеспечения безопасности, в особенности в части тяжелых аварий. Then, in October 1957, there was a major accident in Britain. Emergency at Windscale Atom Plant. And the milk from 200 square miles of farmland is condemned as radioactive. The core of the reactor caught fire and spewed high levels of radioactivity across northwest England. The radioactivity released was far worse than the public was told. It led some scientists to question the speed at which the technology was being pushed to compete with fossil fuels. They included the scientist who had built Windscale, Christopher Hinton. He had been put in charge of implementing the government's plans for cheap electricity. Hinton was a thoroughly honest man, and when he found that all sorts of bogus tales had been told about the relative costs of electricity from nuclear energy, he was shocked. He told me this, that he was absolutely shocked. He uh, realized that the estimates of the cost of nuclear energy compared with the cost of coal energy were cooked. And when I said to him, why didn't you do anything about it? He said, well, I couldn't because the thing had gone too far. You see, so much had been committed then to a nuclear future. No more shillings for the gas. Mother just splits an atom and supper's ready. It must have been some billions that they'd already spent. It was too late. It is, of course, a cliche that, the, that we're living at a time of such rapid scientific change that our children are accepting as part of their everyday life things which would have been dismissed as science fiction a few years ago. We're living perhaps in a more rapid revolution than some of us realize. The politicians were now committed to nuclear power. In 1960, a Labour politician, Anthony Wedgwood Benn, suggested an idea for a party political broadcast. To the hymn Jerusalem, the camera would rise from waving fields of corn to reveal an atomic plant. The conscious, planned, purposive use of scientific progress to provide undreamed of living standards and the possibility of leisure, ultimately, on an unbelievable scale. Nuclear scientists were now being carried along by a political enthusiasm for what science could achieve. Yet few of them in Britain, America, or the Soviet Union knew how to fulfill the promises they had made. There's a new dawn breaking over our world, the hopeful dawn of the atomic era. What benefits But it two large American corporations, Westinghouse and General Electric, had already invested millions of dollars in nuclear technology. For them, there was no way back. In 1961, the new chief executive of General Electric told his staff, we're going to ram this nuclear thing through. 
to new and even greater achievements in the atomic era. This is the hope that awaits us in this new dawn's early light. Control over nuclear technology had passed from the scientists to the industrialists. They were now about to take an enormous gamble to make nuclear power not only practical, but profitable. I'm Bert Wolf. I had General Electric's peaceful nuclear power program. And this is a building which is made to model an actual boiling water reactor. We can come right over here to a facility where down low in the uh, cavity there is the boiling water reactor. General Electric and Westinghouse took the simplest form of nuclear reactor, originally designed for submarines, and redesigned it on a gigantic scale. These were then offered to power companies at knockdown prices. The manufacturers decided to bear any extra costs themselves. They gambled they could start a bandwagon which would make the nuclear business profitable. The key figure was the salesman. We would sell one at a time, and each time we sold one, we'd have a celebration. I can recall when we'd have meetings and someone would come in and said, we sold a plant to somebody, and we'd all stand up and shake hands and go out for lunch and have wine and toast each other. It was a great celebration. Then in the late 60s, we began selling these by the tens, so it became a real business. The plants were sold often before they had even been designed. The power company accepted on faith the manufacturer's claims that because the reactors were big, they would achieve economies of scale. These sales were then cited to the next buyer as proof of the soundness of the manufacturer's claims. In the process, the reactors became bigger and bigger. And it worked. The two corporations sold dozens of plants at home and abroad. Only Britain refused to succumb. A giant of limitless power at man's command. Man is building a brighter future for his children and his children's children in the new world of the atomic age. But senior nuclear scientists were worried about safety in these enormous plants. At the centre of the reactor was the uranium core. Its heat powered the generators. The cores were now so large that if for any reason the flow of water to keep them cool were lost, they would melt. The scientists feared that such a core could then burn its way through the floor of the containment shell. In theory, there would be nothing to stop it emerging on the other side of the world. They called it the China Syndrome. The doubters included Alvin Weinberg, the man who had designed the original submarine reactor. But as long as the reactor was as small as the submarine intermediate reactor, which was only 60 megawatts, then the uh, containment shell was absolute. Now that's not quite right because... When you say the containment shell was absolute, do you mean it was safe? It was safe. But when you went to 600 megawatt reactors and 1,000 megawatt reactors, you could not guarantee this because you could, in some very remote situation, uh, conceive of the containment being breached by this molten mass. And that change, I would assert, occurred as a result of this enormous economic pressure to make the reactors as large as possible. In 1964, a team of scientists working for the Atomic Energy Commission studied the possible consequences of a nuclear accident. They concluded, we have found in our present study nothing inherent in reactors or in safeguard systems as they now have been developed, which guarantees either that major reactor accidents will not occur or that protective safeguard systems will not fail. Should such accidents occur, very large damages could result. And that's when the nuclear dream began to fall apart. In 1965, scientists advising the Atomic Energy Commission tried to force the manufacturers to make their reactors safer. Good evening. Well, as I'm sure you've heard, we're going to have an atomic power plant here in New York. The Atomic Energy Commission has granted to Consolidated Edison permission to build a nuclear steam electric generating station at Indian Point in Westchester County. Westinghouse had already built a small atomic plant at Indian Point. Now they applied to the AEC for a license to build a giant reactor on the same site. At the same time, General Electric proposed a massive plant just outside Chicago. 
The scientists on the Advisory Committee on Reactor Safeguards were worried that a core melt so close to large cities could cause a disaster. They drafted a letter to the chairman of the AEC, Glenn Seaborg, which would by law have to be published. It said they would only agree to the plants if the manufacturers redesigned all future reactors to stop a molten core escaping if an accident, however unlikely, occurred. Seaborg was an ardent proponent of large reactors. We think that it will be possible to build huge uh, nuclear power reactors that will produce electricity uh, at the rate of millions of kilowatts and desalt seawater at the rate of hundreds of millions of gallons a day. Seaborg asked for the letter not to be published. The impact on the industry might be serious, he said, and the public might misunderstand it. He and his fellow commissioners would deal with the problem in private. All I can say is that we uh, tried to take such steps as we could to follow their advice uh, to make the changes that uh, would make them safe. So what did you say to the manufacturers? Uh, we uh, had meetings uh, with the uh, manufacturers and uh, discussed the uh, issue with them. I think they were doing the best they, they could and uh, I don't know that we ever made a tremendous uh, push to try to uh, get them to change their whole manufacturing system. Why not? Oh, I, th I think it was uh, at that time not regarded as a feasible approach. We asked uh, General Electric to come in and discuss how they might cope with this, and uh, in effect they came in and showed the uh, problems uh, that would arise with their containment and indicated uh, they didn't think uh, they wanted to continue selling uh, power reactors if, uh, this, if they were going to have to deal with uh, the core melt problem. Westinghouse showed a, something called a core catcher, but no proof of how it would work. Neither company was uh, anxious to deal with the problem, obviously. Weren't General Electric, in effect, threatening you? They're saying, if you insist on this, then we'll just pull out of this. It was a program. kind of uh, threat, I think, yes. What would have happened if you had said, I think these plants that are being built, these enormous plants by General Electric and Westinghouse, are potentially dangerous. What would have happened if you'd said that? Well, that's a hypothetical uh, question. Uh, you had I'd, the power to do it. What would what would have happened? I don't think we had the power to stop them. Uh, well, we could have uh, we could have refused to license them, of course. Uh, but uh, again, I, I think that in the context of the of the times, it, it's uh, it, it, it's uh, not uh, a, a question that uh, that makes much sense. Indian Point and the other reactors were built without the redesign the committee had asked for. Instead, the AEC ordered a massive upgrading of the capacity of the emergency cooling systems to prevent a core from ever melting. In effect, the manufacturers had got their way, but they had set a terrible trap for themselves. In contrast, in the Soviet Union, the grandiose nuclear plans of the 50s had remained on the drawing board. The Soviet planners were unconvinced they could be constructed cheaply. The physicists and engineers spent their days designing reactors that would not get built. Then, in the mid-60s, Brezhnev came to power. He believed that the road to communism lay through giant technological projects. The nuclear power program began again. It was dominated by Anatoly Alexandrov, famous physicist who had designed what was known as the RBMK reactor. His team planned giant versions to be built around Soviet cities. Ну и в меньшей степени угля, но тоже не хватит для существования человечества даже в течение тысячелетия. Она чище, экологически чище всех остальных видов энергетики.
The idyllic picture of a nuclear Eden masked a reality in which safety was barely even considered. The reactors were built at great speed to cut costs and to fulfill the Soviet plan. Some had no protective containment at all, despite the high pressures of steam. Large amounts of water contaminated by radiation from the reactor core were pumped into giant open ponds. Complete safety for the attending personnel is ensured at the atomic power plant. The slightest radioactive contamination can be detected with the aid of radiation monitors. At the exit of the washroom, there is a dosimetric installation. This will not let you out if there is the slightest trace of radioactivity about you. При Брежневе началось активное разложение, воровство, пренебрежение к делу и так далее. И когда к концу 70-х годов эра Брежнева достигла своего апогея, это совпало с максимумом развития ядерной энергетики. И стало это просто все понятно, и это видели многие. Попытки как-то решить это дело путем служебных записок не имели значения. Нужна была публикация в крупном журнале. Koryakin and a fellow engineer wrote an article in the newspaper Communist. It openly challenged Alexandrov. It criticized the lack of safety in the design of the plants, where they were sited, and the growing question of what to do with the nuclear waste. It caused a sensation. Была создана специальная пресс-конференция, где было сказано, что эта статья клеветническая, что это все не так, все это неправда. Хотя это было уже многим ясно, так как вот это вот я бы сказал научная мафия во главе с Александровым институтом атомной энергии. Но она заняла удобное положение, потому что все награды, ордена, звания, поездки за границу и всякие, как у нас в России говорят, пироги и пышки достига доставались им. А синяки и шишки доставались простым инженерам в других институтах. Ну, это довольно широко бывает в жизни. Часто бывает в жизни. Британ, meanwhile, struggled just to make her plants work. So far, the first of the advanced gas cool reactors being built here on the Kent coast at Dungeness hasn't produced a single watt of electricity. Ordered at a cost of 80 million pounds and due to be commissioned in 1972, it might just start producing electricity in 1977. And really, nobody has a clue how much it's going to cost us. So, why is it that things have gone wrong? For a start... It is with pride that When I Calder Hall was opened, we were leading the world by three years. I can only feel terribly sad because I, I've seen that lead thrown away. I, I find it difficult to put it any other way. A nuclear generating plant is as harmless as a... It's as harmless as a chocolate factory. But a lot more nuclear power is needed. Nuclear power. The power to keep America turning up. Turning up. Turning up. In America, the enormous nuclear plants ordered in the 60s were nearing completion. The engineers in charge were beginning to discover the trap they had set themselves by failing to redesign the containment. If a molten core could not be contained, then the emergency systems to prevent a meltdown would have to work, whatever happened. The engineers had to anticipate everything that could possibly go wrong. In the enormous complexity of the plants, this was proving impossible. One of the main things we began to discover is that our theoretical calculations did not have a strong correlation with reality. While the regulations required emergency car cooling systems, pumps and valves, we didn't really have any basis for knowing that those pumps and valves would actually prevent a meltdown of the reactor. 
because the, the degree of complexity of trying to predict what will happen inside a huge reactor in the midst of a pipe break, we couldn't make any judgments because we didn't have any facts on which to make judgments. During the winter of 1971, a series of tests of emergency core cooling systems were performed at the AEC's private testing site in Idaho. Accidents were simulated in a small model of a reactor. In each case, the emergency systems worked, but the water failed to fill the core. Often it was forced out under pressure. Despite this, both the industry and senior members of the AEC argued that the full-size safety systems were safe enough. I think what happened was the federal government and the nuclear industry decided that the absence of proof of danger was almost as good as proof of safety. In other words, even though we had done experiments that cast doubt on whether the safety systems would actually work if we had an accident, we still had that backup that, well, maybe an accident won't happen while we continue to work to perfect the design of the emergency system. Now, we couldn't announce to the public that we, having told the public that the plants were safe, we now had to disclose to them we were wrong, and then the fact that all these safety systems we told you about, actually, they might not do any good. My goodness, the uproar would have been, we, we, we all probably would have been fired. That would have been the end of this wonderful technology from the standpoint of us. And we just couldn't admit that we had been wrong. And plus, of course, you understand with this one experiment, it didn't prove that the emergency systems wouldn't work in all circumstances. I call it. What is your principal concern right at this minute? Well, my principal concern is that we got an accident that we never been designed to accommodate. On March the 28th, 1979, a series of human and mechanical errors at the Three Mile Island plant exposed the core. It reacted with steam and produced hydrogen, which exploded. None of the emergency teams could understand what was going on inside the reactor. Then suddenly, this helicopter detected a large radioactive cloud drifting towards the nearest town. The voices of the commissioners in charge of the disaster were recorded by a dictaphone that had been left running on a table. What was the time scale involved there? Hours. Hours before what? Before you had a core melt. Before you had a core melt? If you, uh, you would have hours till when you were generating fission products uh, in a core melt kind of situation through the containment. I think, uh, you know, we got the best we got, Joe. And they're not coming up with answers. We got the... Well, don't you think as a precautionary measure there should be some evacuation? Probably, but I must say it's operating totally in the blind, and I don't have any confidence at all that if we order evacuation, we won't move people from a place where they've already gotten a piece of the dose. They're going to get into an area where they will get, uh, yeah, another piece, you know, they will have had 0.5 of what they were going to get, and now they'll move someplace else and get 1.0. Now, Joe? Yes, sir. It uh, seems to me I've got to call the governor. Yes, sir, I do. Uh, I think you've got to talk uh, to him immediately. To uh, do it immediately. We're operating almost totally in the blind. His um, information is ambiguous. Mine is non-existent. I don't know, uh, you know, a couple of uh, blind men uh, now have to stagger around and make a decision here. Don't we know that it's been stopped? We just lost all communication with the control room. For four days, the engineers at the plant watched helplessly as a bubble of hydrogen grew inside the damaged reactor. What they feared most was a further massive explosion. But they knew that if they tried to force the bubble out of the reactor, it might move downwards and completely uncover the core. They would then face the nightmare of a meltdown. The engineers were trapped by the consequences of an accident no one could have anticipated. It was a point they made to the commissioners again and again during the incident. It's, it's in a failure mode that's never been studied. It's just, uh, it's unbelievable. Well, I, the thing that impressed me was uh, how little we really knew about the situation. Um, it was very hard to figure out uh, what uh, was happening. There was a lot of confusion on everyone's part, uh, both on the company's part, the government's part, and a lot of other people who were participating. Uh, and I think this had a very strong effect on the public. Basically, 
to see all the men in the white suits or white lab coats who are supposed to know uh, on TV, basically scratching their heads. Uh, made a lot of people wonder whether things were as much under control as they had been told. Three Mile Island. The President's Commission estimated the cost of the accident could reach $1.8 billion. That's a lot of money to pay for a power plant that may never work again. But Three Mile Island wasn't the first nuclear accident, and it won't be the last. In 1979 alone, there were 20 nuclear incidents that could have led to the catastrophic meltdown of an American nuclear power plant. Don't get sold on nuclear power. We can't pay the price. Their energy policy will benefit the nuclear industry and the oil companies, and they have given only lip service to the solar industry. There were protests against nuclear power throughout the world. In the public's imagination, it was transformed from something good to something bad. Much of the anger was turned on the nuclear scientists. It emerged that they had deliberately concealed many of the risks and uncertainties they had discovered at the very time when they were publicly promoting the wonders of nuclear power. We would, in effect, have solved the energy problem forever, permanently, which in itself is just an, uh, an extraordinary new dimension in, in human experience, to have energy, which is the ultimate raw material. We recognize that there was a risk, but we always deemed the risk to be really acceptable. But now I guess I'm more mature, uh, <laughs> older. I realize that the decision of what is acceptable is not something that we technologists can make. Uh, it's something that the public makes. Why did you think it was something you could make then? You know, I guess it never occurred to me to, uh, to ask this question. Uh, the nuclear enterprise had always been, well, it started out as a secret enterprise, of course, and the notion of the public being intimately involved in very complicated technical issues issues which went way beyond the competence of any member of the public. It just didn't seem that that was the right way to do it. And I think the basic question is, can modern intrusive technology and liberal democracy coexist? The power rises sharply. The rated power level is exceeded. I keep in my safe records of the operator's telephone conversations on the eve of the accident. It makes one skin crawl to read them. One operator telephones another and asks, the program here states what must be done, but a lot has been crossed out. The other thinks for a moment and then says, act according to what has been crossed out. In Kiev, we set off for the nuclear power station. It didn't enter my head that we were moving towards an event on a planetary scale. On the following day, when I went into the ruins of the reactor in an armored troop carrier, I had that sense of anger that there were no solutions, no technical remedies worked out in advance. Of course, we had said such an accident could only happen once in a thousand years. But who said that this once would fall in our year 1986? Это голос Валерия Легасова, академика, одного из моих героев моей повести «Чернобыль», человека необыкновенной и трагической судьбы, человека, с которым я встретился осенью 1986 -го года. Легасов был один из основных архитектов Российской нуклеарной программы. Теперь он вел борьбу в Чернобыле, постоянно летая через радиацию над горящим реактором. As with Three Mile Island, an improbable sequence of errors had led to an explosion and a molten core that had now started to burn its way through the foundations of the reactor. A tunnel was frantically dug directly under the plant by hundreds of volunteers. Liquid nitrogen was poured in to freeze the ground underneath. 
By luck, the nitrogen gas also began to stifle the graphite fire. And then on the fifth day, for reasons that still no one understands, the core began to cool. Despite this, throughout the disaster and the terrible dangers, Legasov remained a staunch defender of nuclear power. The maximum dose was 0.7 rentgens per hour. Over the reactor, we got between 0.3 and 0.5 rentgens. Do you think we'll be able to have children? Yes, don't worry. Are you sure? I've been working with radioactivity since 1964, and I've got kids, don't worry. In the months that followed, Legasov changed his mind. In a long-taped interview with the then-Soviet MP, Yuri Sherbak, he gave a damning criticism of the whole nuclear power programme. The problem, he said, was the demand that was made of the technology. Удивительная была встреча наша с Легасовым, удивительный разговор. Он как-то очень доверительно, очень откровенно вдруг начал мне рассказывать все боли, все то, что он пережил в Чернобыле. It's easy to think or imagine that the enemy is the nuclear reactor, but the enemy isn't technology. I have come to the paradoxical conclusion that technology must be protected from man. In the past, the time that included the old reactors, the time that ended with Gagarin's flight into space, the technology was created by people who stood on the shoulders of Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. They were educated in the spirit of the great humanitarian ideas, in the spirit of a beautiful and correct moral sense. They had a clear political idea of the new society they were trying to create, one that would be the most advanced in the world. But already in the generations that succeeded them, there were engineers who stood on their shoulders and saw only the technical side of things. But if someone is educated only in technical ideas, they cannot create anything new, anything for which they are responsible. The operators of the reactor that night considered they were doing everything well and correctly and they were breaking the rules for the sake of doing it even better. But they had lost sight of the purpose, what they were doing it for. Then two years to the day after the accident, and for unknown reasons, Valery Legasov committed suicide. This world is at a tremble with his strength and mighty power. They're sending up to heaven to get the brimstone fire. Take warning, my dear brother, be careful how you plan. You're working with the power of God's own holy hand. Atomic power, atomic power was given by the mighty hand. In the golden age of science, at the time when society had its most optimistic view of science, it basically had a wrong-headed view of science. It had the view that this form of the technology was the inevitable form that it had to take, and that if that was the form it took, then it must be the right form. Forty years later, we have a similarly naive view. It's no longer tinged by hope and optimism, it's tinged by pessimism and fear. But we still have this view that society can't shape technology, that the form that the technology takes is the form we must accept. And just as it wasn't true in 1950, it's not true today. This is not a story of technology run amok, although that's how many people would understand it to be. The history of nuclear power is a history of, of political and economic and social decisions being made about a technology. And the, the key decisions weren't made by the technologists. They were done in the business realm. What science and technology gives you is a range of possibilities. And those possibilities can take you in any number of directions. It's potentially a liberating force. But to get there, society has to stop sleepwalking and start realizing that it's, it's not a scientific choice. It's not an engineering choice. It's a moral choice. 
Well, George, does that answer your question? It sure does. It's given me a whole new perspective. After World War II, there was a scramble between America and the USSR to develop ever more powerful nuclear arsenals. If you're a digital satellite viewer, press red to find out more. Next, here on UK TV History, we look at the definitive account of Hitler's death.